Hello and welcome to Brass Tax. It's the only show on TV that gives you 100% news and 0% opinion. My name is Zaka Jacob. Here are the headlines on Brass Tax. Home Minister Amit Shah responds to Uddhav Thakre's claims, says it was always decided that Fadnavis will be the Chief Minister, but now the Sena has come up with unacceptable demands. The Supreme Court rules that the Chief Justice of India is a public authority and his office comes under the Right to Information Act. The top court says judges cannot be above the law. Big day in the Supreme Court Thursday. The Supreme Court will give an order on the 56 review petitions on its Shabarimala verdict. Will the Ayutthaya verdict have any bearing? Amid massive protests, JNU announces a partial rollback in its hostel fee hike as well as assistance for students of economically weaker sections. Grab first on brass tax. After 21 days, Home Minister Amit Shah broke his silence on the Maharashtra crisis and he squarely laid the blame on former ally, the Shiv Sena. And he rebutted Sena Chief Uddhav Thakre's claims of discussing a 50-50 deal and rotational chief minister before the elections. स्वयं देवेंद्र फडणवीस ने कई बार कहा कि अगर हमारी यूटी की सरकार आती है बहुमत आता है तो मुख्यमंत्री देवेंद्र फडणवीस बनेंगे किसी ने कॉन्ट्राडिक्ट नहीं किया Yesterday Uddhav Thakre had tried to keep a window open to the BJP provided his demands are fulfilled BJP ne mere sath aane ka ya jo yuti thi wo option unhone khatam hua hoga to unhone khatam kiya hai jo baat us waqt tai hui thi amal karo ye meri maang thi Shah is now calling Thakre's demands unacceptable hum hum ek alliance mein chunav lade the jab sathi dal ne condition aisi rakhna chahiye jo hame swikarya nahi hai और हम अकेले सरकार नहीं बना सकते हम अब कुछ नई शर्तें आती हैं तो हमारे लिए इस पर हमारा रिजर्वेशन भी है पार्टी उचित समय पर इस पर विचार करेगी The 30 year old Shiv Sena BJP alliance ended earlier this week when the Sena pulled out its only minister in the Modi cabinet The separation was NCP's prerequisite for any kind of talks with the Sena but then the NCP and Congress dashed the Shiv Sena's attempts to form a government at least for the moment Meanwhile, CNN News 18's political editor Mario Shakil dissects the Home Minister's statement coming as it does three weeks after the election results. The big takeaway from Amit Shah's statement is that it is the Shiv Sena which changed the goalpost and that they had repeatedly during the course of the election campaign maintained and said it on record and during the course of uh, election speeches that it is Devendra Fadnavis who will be the Chief Minister of Maharashtra. If the Shiv Sena was indeed sure and what had been promised that 50-50 formula, they should have talked about it during the campaign. Why did they raise that issue after? Uh, after the results. So it is the Shiv Sena which is changing the goalpost and Mr. Shah has made it very clear that the BJP is aware that they do not have the numbers despite emerging as the single largest party. They would be playing the waiting game, that they are not in any kind of impatient hurry, that they would rather wait and see how events unfold and that if the Shiv Sena, NCP and the Congress is confident, then they should op approach the governor rather than blaming him of not giving them enough time. Meanwhile, the Sena's Legislative Party leader, Eknath Shinde, was tight-lipped about what Amit Shah said. Government formation ke baare mein, jo bhi nirane lena hai, wo paksha pramuk uddho thakre saab lenge. Kyunki hum sabhi vidhayek jo hai Siv Sena ke, unho ne humare party ke chief uddho thakre saab ko sabhi adhikar diya hui hai. Aur yog ke samay par uchit nirane uddho saab lenge. Last month, during the campaign and at a rally in the presence of Uddhav Thakre, Prime Minister Modi had publicly said that if the Mahayuti were to win, then Devendra Fadnavis would be the Chief Minister. पूरे महाराष्ट्र की जिम्मेदारी है इस विजय को और भव्य विजय बनाने की
Meanwhile, it's a big day in the Supreme Court tomorrow. A five-judge bench will deliver its verdict on review petitions filed on the Shabarimala judgment. The court has to decide what is more important, a woman's right to pray or the beliefs of devotees. The same bench which delivered the landmark verdict in September last year will take a call on as many as 56 review petitions filed against the judgment. Last year, the Supreme Court had ordered that women of all ages must be allowed into the famous Ayyappa Shrine in Kerala. The order ended a centuries-old ban on women of menstruating age. In its judgment, the Apex Court had said that any custom violating the dignity of women is unconstitutional. It also said that patriarchal notions cannot be allowed to trump equality. And one cannot allow the subversion of women's rights under the garb of physiology. I'm not saying faith is above law. We are not above law. Faith is only under constitution. At the same point of time, we only want Article 25 and 26 granted rights to be given to the deity and devotee. With the Shabarimala season about to begin, Kerala police have deployed more than 2,000 officers in and around the temple complex for two weeks to prevent any law and order situation. So what is the basic contention of these 56 review petitions? What they essentially say about why they want a review of the Shabarimala verdict? Argument number one is that the Supreme Court cannot force its views upon devotees of Lord Ayappa or the devotees who throng to Shabarimala every year. The argument, argument number two is that the people of Kerala have not accepted the Supreme Court order. That's why you had a series of violent events uh, in the months after the verdict was announced. Argument number three, that the Supreme Court verdict disturbed societal peace in Kerala. Argument number four, that the 2018 Constitution Bench order was based on a PIL which was filed by non-devotees of Ayappa. They also go on to say that of all the four petitioners were men, not a single woman was part of that. Uh, argument number five, the restriction was not due to physiology but because of the unique character of the deity, in this case a celibate god, Lord Ayappa. Argument number six was that restricting women was not a form of practicing untouchability. Argument number seven, that uh, this you cannot test religion on the touchstone of rationality because religion is beyond rationality. Now there is additional security in and around Shabarimala in keeping with the extraordinary scenes that were witnessed uh, after the verdict came out last year. God's own country was split down the middle between the believers on the one side and women's rights activists on the other. On the 28th of September last year, the Supreme Court ruled that women of all ages can pray at the Shabarimala temple in Kerala. The next month, when the temple opened to the devotees, the Supreme Court's order was blatantly ignored. Women between the ages of 10 and 50 were not even allowed within a kilometer of the temple. Massive protests were held at Nilakyal and Pamba base camps against the entry of women. The chief priest threatened violence if women entered the shrine. Male devotees sat in protest inside and outside the temple premises. Even women journalists covering the protests were not spared. CNN News 18's Radhika Ramaswamy was threatened and intimidated by the protesters. The Pinarayi Vijayan government stepped up security and deployed additional police, but little could be done to quell the anger. Even with police escorts, women were still not being allowed to enter the temple. The protest quickly took a political turn. It was an ideological battle between Vijayan's CPIM and the BJP, which was trying to make inroads into Kerala. 
And after nearly three months of protests and women not being allowed inside Shabarimala, despite a Supreme Court order, there was finally a breakthrough earlier this year. Early in the morning on the 1st of January, these two women entered the Sabrimala Shrine. 39-year-old Kanaka Durga and 40-year-old Bindu Amini managed to get past the protesters to take these historic steps. Actually, I am stand with gender equality and the decision of Supreme Court, I uh, uh, accept the decision and uh, uh, that was uh, established or implement the gender equality. But when news broke out about the two women entering Sabrimala, tensions further flared. Hindu groups called for hartals and hit the streets in protest. Protesters clashed with police and resorted to vandalism. Priests even closed the temple and carried out a purification ritual after the two women entered the shrine. What seems to have given a ray of hope for the devotees of Lord Ayappa is the landmark Ayodhya verdict which came out last weekend. There is a feeling that that could have a bearing on the Shabarimala review and here's why. The Ayodhya judgment says that the court must accept the beliefs of devotees uh, that Ram was born at that place and that's why uh, the disputed site was given to the Hindu side. In the Shabarimala review, they've also asked that the plea is hinged on the belief of devotees and that should be given primacy. The Ayodhya judgment also says, and this is very important, that Ram Lalla is a juristic entity. The deity is a juristic entity. The same legal argument can be extended to Ayyappan as well, who could also be claimed as a juristic entity. In the Ayodhya judgment, the court has said that codes should not enter areas of theology. The court should keep away from things uh, that cannot be rationally explained or logically explained. The Shabarimala review petition also says that faith should be beyond the purview of any legal review. That's not all. Tomorrow is another big day because the Supreme Court will also be delivering within minutes of Shabarimala. They'll be delivering another verdict on a batch of review petitions in the Rafale case. The PILs in the Rafale case had accused Prime Minister's office uh, of interference and conducting parallel negotiations in the defence procurement mechanism and raised concerns of corruption and influence during the Rafale deal. So the question is why the need for a review on the Rafale verdict? The contention by the three people who've approached the court for a review is that there was subsequent to the earlier judgment of the Supreme Court, there were leaked MOD files which seemed to indicate that the government had misled the Supreme Court on the deal. Those files also indicate that the PMO was conducting its own parallel negotiations uh, even as MOD was trying to negotiate with the French company Dassault and with the French government. The Supreme Court, the reviewers claim, are uh, misled into noting that the CAG had audited the Rafale deal when uh, it was only a redacted version of the CAG report that was placed before Parliament and the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, no CAG report were given to, was given to Parliament before the Supreme Court's judgment came uh, and that the Rafale pricing details were never evaluated by the Comptroller and Auditor General. Ravi Prakash, an Indian PhD scholar from Bihar, has won $25,000 BRICS Young Innovator Prize for inventing an affordable indigenous milk chilling unit for smaller and marginal dairy farmers. This innovation is of great socio-economic importance for uh, all the developing countries as it pre preserves the quality and safety of milk right after production. The Indian Space Research Organization has released new images showing the different terrains of the lunar surface. The images were captured and prepared by the Terrain Mapping Camera 2 that is currently on board Chandrayaan 2. Let's take you through these three witnesses who will be testifying this week and what they revealed in the closed-door testimony to the House of Representatives. William Taylor is the acting ambassador of the United States to Ukraine. He said in his closed-door testimony that the Ukrainians knew that they would have to commit to pursuing the investigations against Joe Biden and his son Hunter if they wanted military aid, $400 million of it. George Kent, who you heard from a moment ago, he's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, he said, and I quote in his closed-door testimony, POTUS, that's the President of the United States, wanted President Zelensky, the Ukrainian President, to say publicly that there is an investigation on Biden as well as Clinton, in this case, Hillary Clinton. And the last person who will be testifying later this week is Mari Yovanovitch. She's the former ambassador to Ukraine. She had said in her testimony that a number of meetings between Prosecutor General of Ukraine 
and Mayor Giuliani, that's Rudy Giuliani of New York, uh, who is also the personal lawyer of President Donald Trump. So what is this impeachment inquiry that threatens to remove Trump from office even as he seeks re-election next year? Here's a lowdown. In August, an anonymous intelligence official wrote a letter expressing concern over Trump's July 25th call with the Ukrainian president. The whistleblower claimed that Trump had used his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 presidential election. Incidentally, the call came shortly after the US had blocked the release of $40 million in military aid to Ukraine. A rough transcript of the call later revealed that Trump had urged President Zelensky to investigate former US Vice President Joe Biden, the frontrunner, to take on Trump in next year's election, as well as Biden's son Hunter, who was on the board of a Ukrainian energy company. That was enough for the House of Representatives to launch a formal impeachment inquiry against Trump in September. The president must be held accountable. No one is above the law. While House investigators conducted closed-door interviews with witnesses, Trump kept denying any quid pro quo and called the inquiry a witch hunt. But then in October, Trump's own acting chief of staff made a stunning admission that undercut his repeated denials. We do that all the time with foreign policy. So the, so, so, so the demand for an investigation into the Democrats was part of the reason that he it was ordered to withhold funding to Ukraine. The, the look back to what happened in 2016 That's certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And that is holding, absolutely appropriate. The funding. Yeah, which, which ultimately then, and I have news for everybody, get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. On the 1st of November, the House of Representatives formalized the impeachment inquiry into Trump, while the Democrats say the president abused his power. The evidence is overwhelming and uncontradicted at this point. It's very clear exactly what the president was doing at that point. Republicans have so far shown little interest in removing Trump from office. I don't care what anybody else says about the phone call. The phone call I've made up my own mind is, is fine. Meanwhile, Trump's reaction to the impeachment inquiry has been extraordinary. It's gone from denial to defensive to now an all-out attack mode. Thank you, Thank you very much. When the whistleblower report first came out, Trump went to great lengths to clear the air about his now infamous phone call with his Ukrainian counterpart. The conversation I had was largely congratulatory, was largely corruption, all of the corruption taking place was largely the fact that we don't want our people, like Vice President Biden and his son, creating to the, the corruption already in the Ukraine. But once the impeachment inquiry was launched, he did not bother hiding his disdain for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. During a meeting in the White House, Trump lashed out at Pelosi, who ended up storming out of the meeting. We Standing witnessed on the term. part of the yeah. president was a meltdown. Sad to say. The media was once again at the receiving end of Trump's fits of anger. The question, sir, was what did you want President Zelensky to do about Pres Vice President Biden and his son, Hunter? Are you talking to me? Yeah, it was just a follow-up of what I just asked listen, you, sir. Listen, you ready? We have the President of Finland. Ask this gentleman a question. Don't be rude. Sir, I don't want to be rude. I just wanted you to have a chance to answer the question that I asked I've you. I've answered everything. It's a whole hoax. And you know who's playing into the hoax? People like you and the fake news media that we have in this country. Seconds after the House of Representatives formalized the impeachment inquiry against Trump, he tweeted and called the decision the greatest witch hunt in American history. He even threatened the whistleblower whose report had sparked off the impeachment investigations. The whistleblower should be revealed because the whistleblower gave false stories. What happens next now that the public televised hearings in the impeachment inquiry have begun? Now, if Trump is indeed impeached by the House of Representatives, then it moves to what is called the trial stage. In this case, it moves from one chamber of Cong Congress to the other. It goes to the upper uh, chamber of Congress, which is the Senate, which will hold the trial. A conviction by the Senate requires 67 out of 100 senators. That's two-thirds majority. 
If he is convicted, then the president will be removed from office right away and the vice president will then be elevated as the president of the United States. The Supreme Court today upheld the disqualification of 17 Karnataka MLAs whose revolt had triggered the collapse of the JDS Congress government. But the court has cancelled the Speaker's decision to bar the rebel MLAs from contesting polls till 2023. The judgment is a bearing on the BJP government and also the December 5th by polls to 15 of the 17 vacant seats in the Assembly. Decision of the Supreme Court, they have given the verdict. All 17 MLAs, they can contest for election. And almost on cue, the disqualified MLAs are all set to join the BJP Thursday. This election is going on, Anna. We contest the election. So who will you be contesting with? Will you be joining the BJP? No, no, no. We will go to Bangalore and call our leaders. We will decide it later. The 17 MLAs quit and refused to return to the Assembly. As a result, the JDS Congress coalition fell during a trust vote in July, after which the BJP staked claim. Bipoles to 15 of the seats left vacant by the disqualifications will be held on the 5th of December. So how exactly do the numbers stack up in Karnataka and what will be the scenario after the bipoles on the 5th of December? Right now, there are 208 MLAs and the halfway mark is 105. The BJP and its allies make for one more than the halfway mark, that's 106. So it's a very tender majority. They're just above the line. After the 15 bipoles uh, that will conclude on the 5th of December, the House strength will then go up to 223. The halfway mark then becomes 112. So the BJP will need to win at least six out of these 15 bipoles, at least six more MLAs to go past the halfway mark of 112. A woman was molested and her husband was hit on his head with a liquor bottle. And all of this happened at a crowded restaurant in Gurugram. A group of drunk men surrounded the couple and started arguing with them. The husband tried to shield his wife from the men who kept trying to misbehave with her. One of the men went to the bar, grabbed a bottle and smashed it on the husband's head. Then the gang kept attacking the husband in the restaurant. The entire room just stood by and watched the show, but no one really intervened to stop the goons. तीन बोतलें वो फोड़ते हैं मेरे साथ पे मुझे समझ नहीं आया कि ये इतना रंजिश इतनी किस चीज की और क्या था ये सब The police have registered a case against the accused who are all absconding पुलिस ने केस रजिस्टर कर लिया है और उसमें इन्वेस्टिगेशन जारी है अभी उनकी पहचान करने की कोशिश जारी है इस पे काम किया जा रहा है और रिमेंबर द यूपी कॉप हु शाउटेड टै टै व्हेन हिज राइफल गॉट स्टक now his colleagues are taking a leaf out of his innovation book. This can happen only with the UP police. These police officers are conducting a mock drill. They're supposed to be riding horses, but are making do with batons. Just like one would gallop on horses, these cops jump up and down with batons between their legs. For extra dramatic effect, they even chase a group of people while riding on their batons. This mock drill was done ahead of the Ayodhya verdict to train for crowd management. But this is not the first time that UP cops have used their imagination on the job. Last year in Sambhal district, a cop shouted Thai Thai when a bullet got stuck in his rifle during an encounter. He made the sound in a desperate attempt to scare away the criminals. Whatever their method and no matter how much they get trolled online, these cops deserve full marks for innovation. In a concurring judgment, the Supreme Court uh, has today ruled that the Chief Justice's office will be a public authority which comes under the Right to Information Act with certain conditions. The order was passed by a five-judge constitution bench headed by the Chief Justice of India, Ranjan Gogoi. The other judges happen to be N.V. Ramana, D.V. Chandrachu, Deepa Gupta and Sanjeev Kanna. The order upholds the 2010 order of the Delhi High Court uh, which in this matter had ruled that the CJI's office comes under RTI. Now here's what the five judge bench has essentially said. There were three separate judgments but all of them concurring. In a democracy, 
judges cannot be seen as above the law, that transparency does not necessarily undermine judicial independence, more importantly, that judicial independence and accountability have to go hand in hand, that disclosure is a facet of public interest and of public life, the right to privacy and the right to information go hand in hand. Some other news here on Brass Tax, a video clip of the Amethi District Magistrate Prashant Sharma's meeting with the bereaved family of Vijay Kumar Singh has gone viral. Singh was killed by armed men recently and is the son of the BJP leader Shivnayak Singh. In the video clip, the DM can be seen almost dragging a cousin of the deceased who is also a senior PCS officer. Let's now uh, shift focus to an incident of chain snatching which occurred in Tamar Nadu's Madurai. It was all caught on camera. In the footage, you can see a bike-borne man stopping a woman on a road and then talking to her. Suddenly, he pushes her over. He also falls, but he manages to get up and then rides away with her bag in his hand. Reliance Foundation Chairperson Neeta Ambani has been named as the first Indian trustee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art after years of supporting exhibitions in New York City. The 149-year-old Metropolitan Museum draws billionaires, celebrities and millions of visitors every single year. Neeta Ambani has been promoting Indian art and culture around the world with sports and development programs inside the country as the head of the Reliance Foundation. After 21 days, Home Minister Amit Shah has finally broken his silence on the Maharashtra crisis and he has squarely laid the blame on former ally, the Shiv Sena. And he rebutted Sena Chief Uddhav Thakre's claims of discussing a 50-50 deal and rotational chief minister before the elections. Yesterday, Uthav Thakre had tried to keep a window open to the BJP, provided his demands are fulfilled. BJP ने मेरे साथ आने का या जो युति थी वो आपसे उन्होंने खत्म हुआ होगा तो उन्होंने खत्म किया है जो बात उस वक्त तय हुई थी हमल करो ये मेरी मांग थी Shah is now calling Thakre's demands unacceptable हमें हमें कलाइंस में चुनाव लड़े थे जब साथी दल ने कंडीशन ऐसी रखना चाहिए जो हमें स्वीकार्य नहीं और हम अकेले सरकार नहीं बना सकते हम अब कुछ नई शर्तें आती हैं तो हमारे लिए इस पर हमारा रिजर्वेशन भी है पार्टी उचित समय पर इस पर विचार करेगी The 30-year-old Shiv Sena BJP alliance ended earlier this week when the Sena pulled out its only minister in the Modi cabinet The separation was NCP's prerequisite for any kind of talks with the Sena but then the NCP and Congress dashed the Shiv Sena's attempts to form a government at least for the moment it's an extended school holiday for school students in Delhi and in the NCR, unable to do anything about rising pollution. The Supreme Court mandated Environment Pollution Control Authority has ordered all schools in Delhi NCR to be closed once again. The schools had just reopened this Monday and now they will remain closed again till Friday. Authorities say it's better that the students stay indoors rather than face outdoor pollution, which has reached emergency levels. That's right, there is an air emergency in the national capital right now. The air quality remains in the severe category for the second day running. The toxic haze that has been enveloping Delhi for several weeks now has brought visibility down to a minimum. Delhi mein hawa ek baar fir jahreeli ho gayi hai. Is samay hum Delhi ke Akshadham Mandir ke paas hai. Aap dekh sakte hai hawa mein jo smog hai. वो इस कदर है कि साफ जो मंदिर है वो भी लोगों को दिखाई देने में मुश्किल है क्योंकि आंखों में जलन बताई जा रही है सांस लेने में कठिनाई है रेजिंग फार्म फायर्स इन नेबरिंग स्टेट्स एंड अ फॉल इन टेंपरेचर एंड विंड स्पीड आर टर्निंग आउट टू बी अ डेडली कॉकटेल फॉर दिल्ली व्हाइल दिल्ली चोक्स द पॉलिटिशियंस एंगेज इन अ ब्लेम गेम उधर बारिश हुई तो उन्होंने पराली जलानी बंद कर दी दिल्ली का धुआं कम हो गया अब फिर से बता रहे हैं आज आप ही लोग बता रहे हैं आप ही के टीवी चैनल दिखा रहे हैं कि पराली का धुआं बहुत बढ़ गया तो मुझे बड़ा दुख है कि सुप्रीम कोर्ट का क्लियर आदेश था उस दिन सुप्रीम कोर्ट कितना नाराज हुआ 
उसके बावजूद भी सुप्रीम कोर्ट के आदेश को भी नहीं मान रहे दिल्ली के पोल्यूशन का उन्होंने साढ़े चार साल में एक भी इक्विपमेंट खरीदा जो दिल्ली के पोल्यूशन को कम कर सके ए ने हाल ही में सत्तर करोड़ नब्बे करोड़ के सत्तर व्हीकल्स खरीदे अलग अलग तरीके के and the supreme court is not amused it's asked the government to explore the possibility of using hydrogen based fuel technology it's also asked for aqi data on the days that odd even car rationing scheme was rolled out the supreme court has said there is a need for a permanent solution to the air pollution which has been affecting people in the national capital region and the supreme court's frustration is understandable because who would have thought that breathing the very simple act of breathing would be hazardous to your health as a last ditch solution the sprinklers are being used to settle the dust in the city dust ka pollution hai usko rokne ke liye humne bahut kaam kiya hai aur cpcb ki 50 teamen abhi gathit hai aur wo sab jagah ja rahi hai but that is unlikely to do much to reduce the toxic smog in golfing delhi delhi mein ek baar fir se pradushan ka star badh gaya hai aur badh kar behad khatarnak shredi mein pahunch chuka hai abhi is waqt aap delhi ko overall air quality index dekh rahe hain jo pm 2.5 par 467 hai jo behad khatarnak ki shredi mein aata hai no one is immune from delhi's air The Prince of Wales touched down in Delhi for an official visit. The staff accompanying him was seen wearing masks. Things are so bad that even air purifiers have become passé. Now an oxygen bar has opened in Delhi. People can breathe people can breathe in pure oxygen but at a price. 299 rupees for 15 minutes of pure air 15 minute ka ek session hota hai yani ki 15 minute ka session hota hai jise 299 rupees mein liya ja sakta hai to ek bar mein char log oxy pure bar mein aakar shuddh hawa ka anand le sakte hain hey, well this is proof of how stubble burning in neighboring states like punjab and haryana is actually one of the biggest culprits for delhi's worsening air quality on the 9th of november the aqi was 283 and the share of stubble burning in delhi's pollution was just 8% the next day aqi went up to 321 and so did the share of stubble burning it went up from 8% to 12% on the 11th of november the aqi further increased to 360 and guess what the stubble burning percentage was it rose up to 18% and then on tuesday the aqi crossed 400 and the stubble burning share had jumped up to 25% a quarter of all of the bad air in delhi was because of stubble burning and today the aqi has gone up further to 463 the stubble burning share though has reduced slightly from 25 to 22 students of the jawaharlal nehru university continued with their protests against a steep hike in hostel fees Students stormed into the administrative block demanding a meeting with Vice Chancellor Jagdish Kumar. Students claim that the Vice Chancellor has turned down repeated requests to meet them and discuss the issue. The university authorities have allegedly shifted the venue of its executive council meeting without informing student representatives. Hey, academic year ke beech mein jo fee hike hua hai, ye lagbhag 40 percent ke students jo hai afford kar nahi payenge. Pichle 15 din se ye aandolan chal raha hai JNU mein. Ve JNU BC aur prashasan bilkul suni nahi rahe. The Executive Council is the supreme decision-making body of JNU, which has now taken a final call on the fee hike issue. हम ये बहुत नहीं कर सकते हैं। हम जेनु जैसे संस्थान में आए हैं ताकि हम कर सकें। लेकिन आज भी से कि तो जिस भी से कि बाजार की वजह से आज हम आए हैं, भी से हमारे कैंपस में नहीं मिला है। Not just students, even members of the JNU Teachers Association have voiced out against the Vice Chancellor. कभी भी कहीं मौजूद नहीं होते ये पहली बार नहीं है क्योंकि न तो किसको फेस करना चाहते हैं न विद्यार्थियों को फेस करना चाहते हैं न शिक्षकों को फेस करना चाहते हैं तो वो तो कहीं आते ही नहीं वो घर से ही ट्वीट करते हैं और इवन यूनिवर्सिटी के अदर ऑफिशियल्स को भी नहीं भेजते Apart from the 300% hike in hostel fees, students are also protesting against the curfew time and the dress code. If we make these kind of rules that the university will be deserted, women will not go out at night. They will not even go to the library if the streets are deserted. Now, with the protests in JNU reaching a fever pitch, 
the JNU administration announced a partial rollback in the fee hike. The HRD minister called the rollback major and urged students to get back to classes. But the mood on the ground is mixed. Some students welcome the rollback. But others are not so convinced. As per the rollback, rent for a single room in the hostel was originally 20 rupees, it was revised to 600 rupees and now has been brought down to 200 rupees. For a double room, the rent was 10 rupees originally, it was revised to 300 rupees and now has been brought down to 100 rupees. Aramco has appointed its first woman head of an overseas office. Marwa Al Khuzaim will head Aramco Asia Singapore. She's currently a director at Aramco Chemicals. Her appointment comes just ahead of Aramco's initial public offering, which is expected to be the world's largest. In Bolivia, the opposition senator Janine Añez has declared herself the interim president following former leader Evo Morales' resignation. Morales then fled to Mexico, saying that he asked for asylum there because his life was in danger. He resigned after weeks of protest over a disputed presidential election result. Janine Añez has vowed to hold elections soon in Bolivia. A massive mural of Greta Thunberg was unveiled in San Francisco. The 32-year-old Argentinian street artist who made the mural says that this was his most political creation so far and that he created it to remind residents of the dangers of climate change. The mural stands 60 foot tall and 30 feet wide. Kolkata today turned into a virtual battleground as BJP workers staged protests against West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee. Hundreds of BJP cadre blocked roads and chanted slogans against Mamta Banerjee. BJP protesters scaled barricades as cops used all their might to block them. When one protester broke through barricades, cops pushed him back into the crowd. Angry protesters then set tires on fire and burnt effigies of Mamta Banerjee. When the situation went out of hand, cops fired water cannons to disperse the protesters. Several BJP workers were detained by the police. The demand, of course, uh, was that uh, the, uh, the Kolkata Municipal Corporation has quote-unquote failed in, in, in handling the dengue menace which currently uh, you know, sweeps Kolkata and also uh, some of the adjacent district. The BJP hit the streets over the spurt in dengue cases in the state. It has accused the TMC government of trying to hush up the figures. This after a government report revealed that more than 45,000 dengue cases have been reported from West Bengal, one of the worst affected states in the country. The markets today ended on a lower note. The Sensex ended 229 points lower, while the Nifty lost 70-odd points. Britannia, TCS, Reliance and Nestle and Bajaj Finserve were the top gainers, while Yes Bank, Gale, Z, Adani Ports and Grassim led the losses. Retail inflation rose to 4.62% last month. The surge was driven by higher food prices. Vegetable inflation for the month of October stood at 26% as against 15.4% in the month of September. The Department of Telecom has directed telecom operators to pay their dues within three months as was directed by the Supreme Court. The DOT order follows last month's Supreme Court ruling. The telcos owe the government dues totaling over 1 lakh crore rupees. Vodafone shares fell by 8% today after the group CEO warned that its India business was on the brink of collapse in the wake of the Supreme Court order. At least 12 people have been killed and 20 others wounded in a suicide bombing near the Kabul airport. The target of the blast appeared to be an armoured vehicle belonging to the Garda World, which is a Canadian security company. The blast was so powerful, it even smashed the windows of houses and shops located nearby. Well, that's not all. Two days of Israeli airstrikes against Palestinian Islamic jihadists have killed 24 people in Gaza. The exchange began after Israel carried out two assassination attempts on Islamic jihad chiefs, uh, one of which was successful. Both sides have fired more than 250 rocket bombs. Meanwhile, a UN envoy is currently in Cairo for mediation talks.
Hundreds of car and truck drivers were stuck in a large traffic jam in northeastern Spain. The traffic jam was caused by Catalan separatists who were angered by the recent imprisonment of nine pro-independence politicians and activists. The protesters began gathering on the highway last night and by this morning they had built up several large barricades out of tree branches and the road's metal guard rails. Despite heavy snowfall, tourists have been flocking to Kashmir, which has turned into a winter paradise. Tourists in large numbers rush to catch an early snowfall at Ramban's Nathatop. Dressed in layers of winter wear, they clicked selfies and made snowballs. Most of them have made a pit stop here before trekking to Vaishno Devi. We have played here games, we have enjoyed it, it's a lot of snowfall, it's a lot of fun. We have come from Gujarat, here is Nathar Top, we have enjoyed it, 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 we have enjoyed it. Ever since it started snowing in Kashmir, the tourism industry has got a big push. Local businesses have picked up as the influx of tourists have increased. Transport network has also improved. Both bus and train services have resumed after a 10-day gap. The situation improved after the crucial Jammu Srinagar highway reopened. In Srinagar, snow clearing operations have been going on with full swing. Hundreds of homes are still covered in snow, forcing residents to stay inside most of the times. The situation is similar in Himachal Pradesh, which has also received record snowfall this year. The Rotang Pass, which is the gateway to Lahore, opened to traffic after 10 days. It was covered in over 100 centimetres of snow and debris caused by landslides. The Med Department has predicted heavy snowfall in Kashmir, Ladakh and Himachal this week. Well, despite Article 370 and the lockdown, tourism continues to thrive in Kashmir. That's a wrap of Brastak.